Welcome to Novel Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. There are just three things I ask of you, if appropriate to you and your experience. Please subscribe, please click on the like button, and please share this program link with any family members, friends, or colleagues who might be interested or benefit from the content. Now, on with our program. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Sims, and I'm very pleased to be here with Mike today. Uh, I'm the author of the Rita Farmer Mysteries and the Lambda and GCLS Goldie award-winning Lillian Bird crime series and some other fiction, including a standalone novel called Crimes in a Second Language, which won the Florida Book Award Silver Medal. Um, my work has been published by a major press, Macmillan, as well as several smaller houses, and I've written short works for numerous collections and magazines. I'm also, uh, uh, you know, this is kind of bragging time here, I guess, uh, in this introduction, I'm an internationally recognized authority on writing. Um, I've written many, many feature articles on the craft of writing for Writer's Digest magazine, um, which is the leading writing magazine uh, I think in the world, certainly in the Eng English speaking world, uh, and I'm a contributing editor there on their masthead. I've written an instructional title as well called You've Got a Book in You, a stress-free guide to writing the book of your dreams. That's from Writer's Digest Books, and that has helped a lot of uh, authors over time. Um, I've taught creative writing at the college level. I have a couple of degrees in literature, so I'm two degrees above zero there. Um, and I have had a variety of uh, work experience, a reporter, photographer, a street busker, bookseller, a certified lifeguard, and symphonic percussionist. Uh, so anyway, several uh, literary societies are, are uh, ashamed to call me a member, and uh, also American Mensa, as it happens. American Mensa, like the Mensa Society, which is geniuses, correct? Well, that's that's the... That's what people say we are. Although I've met a number of fellow Mensons, which I, which, you know, who would give the lie to that? It would seem <laughs> at some meetings and so forth. But yeah, it, just because you have a high IQ doesn't mean that you have a lot of common sense all the time. It's kind of funny. But that's the metric, right? You have to have a high IQ that's to right. be part of the Mensa Society. Yes, so, that's right. So your IQ, I won't ask you to actually say what your IQ is, but you obviously pass the. Uh, the threshold there. So this is why you can write stress-free books, but none of our li listeners are going to believe they can write a stress-free <laughs> book. I'm sure. As, well, it's a stress-free guide to writing the book of your dreams. So the guide book won't stress you out, but then sitting down to write will stress you out, I would imagine. But we're going to get into that a little bit. I will say that I get yeah, Liz came to my attention uh, because she wrote a uh, uh, she, she she writes for Writers Digest, as she said, but she wrote a piece called the Ten. 10 minute fixes to 10 common plot problems. And, and um, she talks about how structural problems can sink your novels. So you better get that right. And uh, so let's talk about how to fix them. Uh, we'll get to that. But the amount of, you know, of work you do in the writing field is you've got two different book series. Mm -hmm. You you write for the magazine. You've written a nonfiction book uh, teaching people how to write. You coach people in writing, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, I have done so, although I'm going to be winding that down uh, fairly soon. Why is that? Is it is it not worth your time because you it's cutting into your writing time? Oh, well, um, as I have gotten a little older uh, and the sh shadows have grown a little bit longer in life, um, I've realized that I just need to f focus more on my own writing and other and writing related projects, including helping writers. But uh, the the. Uh, kind of coaching and consulting and freelance editing that I've done is very time consuming and I do a very good job at it and I have clients that want me to keep working with them but it's just uh, it, it just is more time consuming than I really want to do at this point uh, looking at you know looking at so many other things that are as yet undone that I really want to do so. Well, between your articles, in-person workshops, online teaching, you've you've already helped thousands of fledgling authors. So I think you've 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 stored up the good karma, no question about that. <laughs> Very and, nice. and you have a book out there called uh, that that you we were just talking about the stress free guide to writing. Talk a little bit about let let's let's start no, actually let's make that um, the number two thing we talk about. I would like to understand 
when you talk about American Mensa, when you guys get together, what do you, what's the purpose of getting together? What do you guys talk about? Are you trying to find a unified theory of the universe? <laughs> are, you, are you trying to, uh, to solve world hunger? Uh, what do geniuses <laughs> talk about when it's kind of like, okay, we're together and we're geniuses. So now what are we going to talk about? Oh, gosh. Well, um, f- first of all, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of ashamed to say that I don't really attend many meetings. I used to in my younger days. And, uh, and it, mostly I really kind of got involved in it as a social thing. Um, and so I, I don't know, but lately I, I keep up my membership because I kind of like having the credential, you know, it, it, it some people find it impressive and, you know, others yeah, find it off putting, I suppose, but, but anyway, uh, in the, the, uh, uh, when I have gone to like, actually I have gone to a few, uh, gatherings and uh, they're, um, uh, you know, often just very social. And then there will also be programs. Somebody will talk about something of interest, you know, that we'll have, we'll have people lined up to, to speak on certain topics. And that can be very interesting because usually they're quite an expert on the topic. And, um, and so that, you know, if it's a subject of interest to you, then you're, you're kind of getting it at a pretty deep level. And so that can be satisfying. So uh, social, you know, I, I guess a lot of people might think geniuses aren't the most social people. <laughs> they, they can be a little nerdy. They can be a little insular and all that. Yes. Um, but that hasn't been the case when you sat down with Bill Gates and, and Elon Musk. They've been <laughs> uh, just scintillating personalities. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, it, as you say, it, it is very common for uh, people of high IQ to be reserved or to be nerdy or to have, you know, I guess it's a cliche to say that they have the, that they're, quote, on the spectrum like Asperger's or something like that. Um, uh, but um, I, actually, there are, I have found that some of the most um, personable people and successful in kind of a holistic way, uh, people that I've known have been very bright and it, 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 being, being a little extra bright, I suppose, helps a person to see past themselves. And that's a really key thing as far as being successful socially and as a leader, whether it's business or in whatever arena, uh, uh, being able to look at people to understand them. I've always been a, a person who has looked at other people and watched other people and tried to figure out why do people do what they do? I find that to be like the great question of life, you know, to me. And, and of course, as a writer of fiction, that's like a key thing. You know, you want, you, if, if there's a, somebody who wants to write fiction and they're not curious about the, the people around them, they, there's no way they can put out something that's going to be very interesting, I think, because, they're, you know, if they're not interested, they, they're just, their writing will be flat. So, so uh, I, I find that, you know, having, you know, being, and, and being able to communicate, being able to communicate with people, you know, like you mentioned, Bill Gates and so forth. Um, uh, people who are, who are successful, good leaders, uh, as I say, in whatever area uh, of, of life, um, they are, they not only have the gift of, or the, you know, an interest in other people, but the willingness to communicate well. And I say willingness because it, it isn't just like an ability to communicate well. It's a willingness to be, to be open, to be, um, you know, to, to listen, of course, and to be oneself and to risk making a mistake in a conversation or, or looking foolish as you might, one might think you look foolish. Uh, and, and I have found that being being open in that way and being willing to admit being wrong and so forth, that those things are, you know, are often found charming, uh, you know, and they're appreciated by other people rather than just, uh, you know, someone just trying to be trying to be right all the time or, right. to, you know, yeah. that, that sort of thing. People, they, people think more of you, not less of you when you're willing to admit that you're wrong or oops, uh, silly me. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely much more endearing than somebody who just is uh, always going to uh, fight the fight that, no, no, I was right. Uh, I, I, I was right. They got misinterpreted somehow. Mm hmm. So, um, you know, even when you talk, Elizabeth, you sound busy. <laughs> you do. You sound busy. I'm glad you took time out to do this, but you sound like a person who in the back of your mind right now, you've got a bunch of projects cooking away. The Rita Farmer is yelling at you about finish, <laughs> finish the scene with me or, or Lillian Bird is in the middle of a crime. And, uh, or, and uh, there, there, there you are um, talking to a stranger. 
Uh, but, but am this I, is but Mike, wait a minute, Mike. Am I coming across though as too as too rushed or too forced? Do I sound no? Upset? No, you sound you sound fine, but you do sound like a busy person. You're, <laughs> you're high energy and busy, and all I have to do is read your bio. In fact, um, I will tell our listeners that I that the uh, URL for Elizabeth Sims uh, website is in the episode notes and you can learn uh, all about her. There's a lot going on over there. And when you uh, read her bio, which she gave you a snapshot of it, but um, when I read it, I was thinking, wow, do I feel like a, a you know, a slacker <laughs> compared, compared to you. Oh. But that being the case, um, let's, I do want to get to this book about, you know, the stress-free guide. Um, mm -hmm. There's so many people out there and you say you have a book in you. Now, everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, but there's so many people who think I've got a book in me. There's a story I want to tell. And usually they have this one book that they want to tell because, oh, you wouldn't believe what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And people, but, and it all comes to an end when they actually sit down to write, because I think people <laughs> have no idea what an exacting <laughs> And, and uh, there's so much drudgery to writing when you start out. You really do just kind of realize, wow, um, how do people write books? I can't even get a thought out and onto paper. So um, do people really have a book in them? Talk about that a little bit. What's, what's kind of your premise there? Sure. Um, the when I, well, when I was a young person, I had the drive to write and I had the drive to you know, be somewhat successful, hopefully at, at writing and which means getting some stuff published and out there and connecting with readers. And so I set myself to, to writing. I, I had an idea for a mystery novel and I thought, well, you know, this could be maybe a standalone or this could be maybe a start of a series. I know readers like series. And, and, and so I, I started in on the drudgery, <laughs> really. It felt, it felt very, very much like drudgery and it felt difficult. It felt effortful to me. And, but I kept at it. And eventually I realized, you know, if I, I, I realized that I was overthinking, that was, that was kind of really one, one, like to, to simplify, I was overthinking and trying to force things more. And when I got looser and actually sloppier with my writing, I, f I found that it, it, it flowed better and it, it, it read back better, you know, even though it felt, let's say, felt sloppy to me as I went. So, so what I realized is that m many people can, can um, unlock their natural talent and creativity uh, if you just get out of your own way. You know, because so many of us have so many preconceptions about writing and what it should be. And, oh, it ought to be, it must got to be grammatical. And I got to make sure I get my punctuation right. And I got to make sure I, oh, and my handwriting is too sloppy that my first grade teacher told me that, you know, and, and I, I still remember that, those, those horrible times, uh, you know. And, and, and the, the uptight English teachers that were like, this paragraph needs a transition, uh, you know, and you're like, oh, God, it just makes you clench up. And, you know, so getting getting rid of just like un, unburdening yourself of some of that um, of some of that rigid crap is all, often just all one needs to. Get, you know, give oneself permission to just to start throwing it down there, you know, and see what happens. And and the thing is too, Mike, it, writing writing should be fun, and it should be it should be easy, and, and these things can help make it fun and easy. And, and another, I guess, another thing is a bit of a mental trick where if if you, you know, I mean, and I think all of us can relate to this to one extent or another. You you're doing some. A chore, or, or an errand, or an event, or doing something, and this is so not fun. Okay, well, I can either suffer through it and call it not fun and be miserable, or I can go. Well, wait a minute. How can I make this fun? Maybe I can make a slight change to make this fun. Maybe making it fun is maybe maybe all I need to do to make it fun is to decide that it's fun. <laughs> you know, to decide that this is a cool, fun thing to do. And that, man, yeah, to dig it here, man, dig it. Gamify it, somehow yeah. gamify yeah. it in some way. Yeah. yeah. Now, let me ask you this, though. Um, there's a lot to unpack in what you just said. Uh, and it, I, I get it. But I'm also wondering, when you first sat down to write novels, did you feel that, or kind of come to the conclusion that you were trying to sound like a novelist? You were trying to 
write a certain way that sounded like the books you had read? Oh, was that part of the issue, or be, because when you mentioned grammar and all that, yeah, uh, uh, and, and punctuation, <laughs> clearly that's what took back. I, I, I've argued this before that back when we were in school, we were never taught to write properly. We were all taught a bunch of rules and regulations. And then we were graded on that instead of our imagination and creativity uh, and adventure and, and our sense of adventure and all that. But there's also the, the, the part of actually the writing process where you're putting the words down and you uh, start to feel, I know that I felt that I'm trying to sound like a novelist. I shouldn't do that. Mm. I should just write. I should just put it down. When you said that you allowed yourself to get sloppy, I think you were talking about more than not uh, than, than than keeping the punctuation and grammar right. It sounds right. like you were just allowing your thoughts to flow and not trying to make make each sentence construction perfect. Right. Nor paragraph construction, nor scene construction, nor nor anything perfect. That's for sure. You got to dump perfectionism. And and so, you know, my book, you've got a book in you, is is a collection of techniques to help and a method really to help aspiring writers get out of their own way and let their natural talent and creativity take over. There's there's brainstorming, uh, uh, ideas and protocols that I put out there that have been very helpful to me and that have been helpful to my readers, uh, things like that also. And, and just pure plain, I really try to give everybody permission to go a different way, to go their own way. Now, you can't just, of course, just vom out anything on the page and say, well, I think it's good, so therefore it ought to be good. I mean, there are standards, there are common standards. Uh, you know, a, a, an agent or an editor is not going to... Um, uh, respond well to 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 something that has no structure, for instance, or you know, fill in the blank. So, so yes, we do have to have some. There's have to have to be some structure, some parameters. Well, but but really, well, there's a lot of, more freedom. You have a lot more freedom than you think you do when you're starting out. Yeah, well, that's exactly it. And, and I think sometimes, I mean, that, that's a big issue. It's a big issue. And I. I I think that also sometimes you just have to say, I'm writing for myself. I'm not writing for an audience. This is for mm -hmm. me. I'm going to write what, what comes out of my heart or yes. out of my head. Mm -hmm. um, what is the result of when you wrote, wrote sloppy and you allowed yourself to do that, did you find that were you coming up with a finished, pretty much a finished product that needed editing? Or is it just that you were, getting it out there and you're going through uh, several different, almost like applying the paint to a canvas where you're going to splotch it on there and then you're going to continue to reshape it as you go. Um, I mean, how, how out of a hundred percent, what percent of your sloppy writing, where did you land? 50%, 90%, 75%, that, if that makes sense. I, 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 yeah, it does. I And I think it's an interesting question. I don't believe I've ha had that before, that anyone take that approach before. Um, so uh, I, I would find, what I would find is uh, occasionally there would be like these flashes of brilliance where I'd be rolling along like for like a few paragraphs or a few pages maybe even. And, and I'd be like, wow, that's really, that's good and complete, you know. And then there would be fits and starts where, uh, you know, like I'd, I'd write a sentence one way and I'd, I wouldn't cross it out. But I, that's another thing. Don't cross stuff out as you go. Just just write it again. It, 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 you know, if, if you're like, I don't like yes. that sentence. Here's a good, just keep going. Just like, I kind of call it overwriting in my in my mind. Just just keep rolling. And so, or, or you know, separate sen sentences or separate options with a slash or something like that. And you'll know you know, when you go back over, you'll, you'll know what to do. Um, so, uh, so, all right. I, you know, I don't know. I suppose it, well, it got, <laughs> I'll tell you I, it, when I was starting out and still just trying to write a, a first novel, uh, being young and only having and working full time at a, at a demanding job and, uh, being able to just take a, like an hour or so after work, I'd stop at a cafe and uh, get a coffee and a treat or something, and then uh, and, and say to myself, "Okay, I'm not going to get up until I've got 300 words down." So, um, in those 300 words in the early days, there was probably at least 50 or 60 percent stuff that was not real stuff, but was kind of the the 
unformed stuff that primes the pump, I guess you could say that. And then the rest of it was like halfway decent. And then as I continued, you know, went forward, got older, got more experience, more life experience, more experience as a writer, and got a couple books under my belt, everything started to flow more smoothly. And I started to build momentum. You know, that's something that happens. But I will also say that, and this is a little bit off to the side, but many writers, newer writers feel, well, I have to write every day. I have to follow a certain protocol or else I'm, uh, you know, then because everybody says, well, you got to keep at it and you can't make, can't have it be too long between writing sessions. I, mm, it is great to be able to write regularly every day. That's wonderful. But if you don't, don't let that dissuade you or let that make you feel like you're not good enough or something. You just, just get back on the horse and keep going. And oftentimes you really won't feel like you've, like you're, like you've what fallen back or something, you know? So mm-hmm. don't mm-hmm. just don't Why do you have stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, God, there's so much to it, but um, I, I noticed you worked as a reporter, a photographer, a technical writer, a bookseller, a street busker, <laughs> a ranch hand, a corporate executive, and a symphonic percussionist. Um, mm-hmm. You sound like a person who gathered a lot of, you know, life experience that uh, you could then convey or trans transmigrate into your books. Uh, did you feel that was the case? I mean, did you know you wanted to be a writer from a young age? And and because uh, I, I know a guy who who went out and really he wanted he knew he wanted to write, but he didn't go out and start writing. What he did is went out and did a whole bunch of interesting things like what you're talking about here. And then he finally decided now I have enough life experience to be a novelist. And he's he's written a few. And I think he's on his fourth now. Oh, that's what wonderful. That sounds really cool. Uh, I didn't deliberately set out to have a wide variety of life experience so as to fuel a writing career. Um, I, I was really kind of unfocused, actually, as a younger person. Yeah, I wanted to write, but yeah, I thought, oh, I don't know, you know, I still have to put, you know, potatoes on the table, so I need this job or that job. And I kind of drifted around from to, to, from different jobs to different jobs. Um, the, the reporter job, a uh, reporter and editor job at this little paper that I had for just a couple of years, about two, three years after college was a fabulous learning experience, not only in how to um, produce under pressure. Now, this was, of course, prose and not creative writing, but, you know, you had to put together a story about whatever the thing was that you had just gone out and witnessed and taken notes about and interviewed people about, and you had to do it by a certain time or things would be bad. And so, uh, so that was very, really, really good experience. And it also made me unafraid, you know, cause there's that thing. It's like, you, you can't, you don't have time to sit there and angst over something. It's like, just your template, write it down, you know, to do your best, <laughs> put it down there, uh, type it in, you know? So, uh, so that, uh, so, but I did, yeah, I did kind of drift around and I have, having gotten a liberal arts degree, having gotten an English degree and my undergraduate and then about roughly 10 years later, I got my graduate degree also in uh, English uh, literature and composition theory. <sighs> so, I, like, I'm one of those liberal arts majors where it, like, worked out. But not having gotten a professional degree, I, was, I wasn't all that qualified to do anything. I couldn't go and be an accountant or I couldn't be a police officer or I couldn't be a, you know, uh, you know fill in a blank, you know, lawyer, doctor. Uh, and so... Uh, I just kind of had to cast around and see what, you know, what was what uh, and what, you know. But it didn't stop you. No, you know, so it just kept on rolling and kind of struggling along and muddling along and, you know, eventually. And now you have two book series. You have Rita Farmer Mysteries and then you've got uh, Lillian Boyd Crime Series. Why two? Why did you decide to split? I mean, a lot of people spend their whole career doing the, the, you know, the same detective or the same, um, you know, the same situation. Uh, Tony Hillerman did that. Uh, you, you, you've got, I mean, it's endless, the number of people. Um, so why did you, which one came first? Was it Rita or was it Lillian? No, it was the Lillian series that came first. And I had to decide, so I want, I wanted to write this novel and I thought I'd like to write a mystery series. And I had to decide, do I want to write it from more of my own personal experience and and that it would be categorized in the LGBTQ uh, world, or do I want to write a more mainstream series at first or book at first? And I thought, well, I'm going to kind of stay true to my school and write about a queer person who becomes a 
an amateur sleuth. And so that's kind of how the Rita Farmer series got going. And I also started that by, by using some of my experience as a reporter uh, in the first for material for the first book. Uh, and so that was helpful. Uh, and so, okay, so that, and then the second book in that series called Damn Straight, the first one was Holy Hell, the second one, Damn Straight. And then I ran out of garden variety swear words to use. <laughs> I didn't use any more swear words in the next several. But Damn Straight won a Lambda Literary Award, which it is the top award in the to queer writing universe and so i thought well all right i have talent I, this is a validation i know i'm i have some you know i know i'm halfway decent here i know i'm good so then so i wrote a few more in that series but i thought you know i would really like a, a broader audience and that was really the thing that made me decide to write um pardon me to write the Rita farmer series uh, or, or start, start out by writing you know by, by writing something by writing a book that was a more mainstream book and so or in the kind of mystery and crime genre so i wrote one and i started shopping it around to agents and then and 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 uh, one agent got back to me saying well i i this book i can tell you're a very good writer but i don't think i could sell this book what other ideas do you have and i said well i have this one about an actress who who uh, you know winds up solving crimes using her acting abilities and here's kind of the outline of the story that I'm thinking about. And she's like, if you can write that, I think I can sell it. So I wrote that book and she did sell it. And that, that led to the Rita Farmer uh, series, which right now stands at, at three books. And it probably is over at this point because now I am working on a new series. Um, I mean, a, a book that I hope will be the first in a new series, and I may self-publish it or I may uh, try to go the mainstream route with it, but I don't know. So, Why uh, self-publish? Are you thinking that it's going to be hard to get uh, uh, agents and editors on board with it? Well, it, uh, given that, I mean, given the whole digital publishing revolution, which didn't exist, you know, 15 years ago or less than that, uh, and given now how easy it is for an author to put out their own material, uh, to get it, you know, to get it into good shape, put it out there. I mean, you know, Amazon Kindle revolutionized the whole thing, and there are a great many authors who are uh, have been very successful in self-publishing. Uh, and in fact, I mean, my my two series are now I ha I've gotten the rights back from the original publishers and uh, there I'm doing them on my own now. So uh, so I own all the proceeds at this point. So um, so there's that. So one, the digital publishing is much more easy for people to reach readers with and also to do marketing, to do advertising. Uh, and the other thing is that the so-called, let's say the traditional publishing business they were very slow to catch up to the digital revolution and and tr figure out their place in it and figure out how they can make it work for them and they've gotten way better at it than they were back you know 10 plus 10 and five to ten years ago they've gotten way better at it but they it's still they can still only do so much for you as an author uh, your publisher if you do get a publisher will expect you to be very active on social media and do you know you know try to you know do, do all kinds of stuff to draw attention to yourself online and wherever else uh, and and so you know they're the great big publishers if you're a darling of a great big publisher they're going to be able to do a lot for you and they will do a lot for you and you'll be on the bestseller list and so forth and you you're going to have to do a lot of work too but they'll really come through for you but the mid-list authors are really you know almost on their own and the other thing is you do not you don't get to keep your money uh, with the mainstream publishers or a, any publisher is going to take a pretty large percentage of the sales and mm -hmm. you get very little. I mean, for instance, audio book. I mean, no, let's just let's just say the digital books and ebook. It's very easy to produce an ebook, and when you're with a publisher, they're going to give you 25% of the price of that of what they get for that ebook on online wherever it's being sold. Whereas if you do it yourself through, say, Amazon, you get 70%, and that's a huge difference. And so, you know, so there's that. So there's financial considerations to be made as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Talk about um, 
You you just wrote recently, I know you've written on a lot of different subjects for Writer's Digest, but you did talk about plot problems and the kind of writing you do and the kind of writing most people do, they are heavily plotted. Uh, I suspect that you, although you tell me, I suspect you outline your novels. You you come up with the plot, the complete plot, before you decide to start writing it. You want your roadmap. Is that true? Um, yeah. Uh, yes, it, it, it sort of wasn't in the early, my early days. My first few books were a little more seat of the pants, but and they came together well enough. Although my you know, the very first book in the Lillian series is the weakest one I consider, uh, and the rest of them I'm I'm pretty proud of. But uh, so yeah, over time I have become more meticulous with plotting in advance, uh, so that I can have so that I can. It, it takes away stress, really, because you know where you're going, you know, you, you know what you need to do next. And that's very helpful, I find. And of course, every, <laughs> just to one more thing along those lines, when authors get together and talk about these things, we always are like, you know, I mean, like everybody has almost, <laughs> almost everybody has the same answer. You have to have some idea of where you're going, but you also need to have room for wiggle room for spontaneity. You know, if, if a character just wants to do something different than you thought they were going to do, well, by golly, you might just have to follow and see where that goes and, and dive, you know, diverge from your, from what you thought you were going to be doing. So when these plot problems come up, the, these are things that present themselves as you're actually doing the writing uh, is, is, uh, is what you would argue, or are you saying that people, they'll, they'll go ahead and write out to plot out the novel. And well, actually one of them here uh, talks about having just overwritten. It's overkill. There's too much being said about this. It's, it's point number four. I have to communicate a lot of information and it's overkill. So obviously that's during the writing process. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about some of the most common pro plot problems and maybe, maybe why they occur. Yeah, well, uh, the one that you just mentioned, we, we can t talk about that a bit, uh, uh, which is, yeah, you're, you you have to like give a bunch of information or a bunch of information is about to, to need to be told to the reader and how to do it without just, you know, seeming like you're, you know, writing a memo for a, you know, a, a merger. So, uh, uh, you, you so, so what to do? And uh, well, my, my uh, uh, key advice here is to make it livelier. And how do you make it lively? The word live, al live, alive, have characters deliver this information, have a character. Have a, if you can get some dialogue in there, if you can convey it by the use of dialogue, much better than having a character just sitting there thinking about it or uh, realizing it or reporting it to the reader that they figured this out or that they learned this information. Show it, if it's important enough, you can show it to us in, a, in an actual scene. And of course, then if you can give some action coming along with the dialogue, that that is you know all to the better you know relevant action but even even irre irrelevant action like a couple of characters even taking a walk through the woods while they're talking over something you know you can do something with that you can even you know you, you can have one of them look at a bird sitting on a branch and the bird uh you know the color of the bird reminds them of the hair color of this person that is important in their life or the bird they realize there's kind of a symbolism about this bird flying or oh look there's a bird with a broken wing oh that's how i feel right now i you, know, you can just really you know you, you can <laughs> use almost anything you know uh, or a wild animal attacks one of the yeah, one of the parties <laughs> yeah right you know and then you know oh oh damn i didn't bring my sharp stick or you know i don't know whatever <laughs> the hell you know <laughs> there would be a key turning point don't you think most, uh, most, uh, especially popular novels, I would say, but not entirely just popular novels uh, or commercial novels, but I think most of them have too much dialogue in them that it's almost as though the author doesn't want to tell the story. And nowadays, what seems to sell really well is books that have a, a really strong uh, authorial voice. Somebody who takes you from stem to stern mm -hmm. on that book and is a consistent, strong voice versus this, the prattle of a bunch of characters who are constantly saying stuff that a lot of times is pretty, is pretty mundane. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. 
You know, I think one of the worst piece, worst piece of advice uh, a lot of writing coaches hand out is, you know, write like people talk. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but I mean, if you've ever, I think I've told this story before on the podcast. I well, one time when I, I was just a kid, and and back in the day, you could pick up a a landline and listen. And this happened only once in my life, but there was these two young women on the phone talking, mm -hmm. and it's like, hello, hello. I'm like t trying to talk to them. I realize they can't hear me at all, uh -huh. and so I thought, you know. I'm just going to listen for a little bit. What are they talking about? And it was in, in it was incredibly boring, <laughs> incredibly boring. I ended up hanging up the phone. And uh, yes. most people talk in a very boring fashion, and in there and in, there's really no forward motion to it, no forward movement mm -hmm. as far as that goes. Anyway, I'm I'm drifting here a little bit. Oh, sorry. But I, I I just have to get to the that that part. I really wanted you to kind of talk a little bit about whether you think uh, there's there's an overuse of dialogue. Well, you know, I guess maybe that's a bit of a pendulum swing somehow in the, the current fashion. Um, oh, God. Yeah. You, uh, an author can get lazy about, you know, in, in just about any way. You know, you can overly, you can do too much over explaining with a, with a narrator so that it's like, okay, man, when, when's something going to happen here, you know? And you can get pretty, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? If I, uh, you can almost uh, too yeah too much dialogue can dumb it down and and get repetitive you know for sure. So you know I, as with everything you need a balance, and it, it's kind of interesting in that it, that that what you said about there may be a bit of a swing towards more of a narrative voice, and certainly you have to have a strong narrative voice you know to to be to really reach readers. Uh, I would say that first person narratives, you can do that the most easily. And, you know, uh, where, where you have one character telling the story from that character's viewpoint in my books tend to, to rely fairly heavily on first person narrative. And I find it a lot of fun because you can give so much about that character through that own, that character's, uh, you know, observations, what they choose to observe, what they happen to see and what they don't, what they miss, you know, who, who they think they are and who they may betray themselves to really be, uh, you know, when, when it comes time to action or when other characters reflect themselves back to them. So um, those are all elements, you know, of, of good, uh, you know, of, of a good story, you know. So here's an interesting one. You have down here as one of the uh, common plot problems that uh, my action. Well, actually, let me jump ahead to this one. One of my characters is starting to seem lackluster. What about that? How do you fix a situation like that where you realize you think you have a good character, but but it's kind of like, hey, uh, this this guy's not turning out to be so interesting. Yeah, you know, one one basic thing would be to first say, do I really need this character? You know, get get tough and brutal about that. You know, can I combine this character into another one, or can I cut out his? If this subplot that I've got going, let's say, with this one character, if that's not really going anywhere and it's not really affecting the main plot, and it's not, and I don't really know, you know, maybe maybe just try cutting that person out and see see how it goes. Uh, the another thing. Um, one can do is just make, make that character a bit more interesting. You can give them a a quirk, an obsession, something that that will make them stand apart and that can give them trouble. Let's say, like, let's say if they've got some kind of a, uh, they might have a phobia, you know, a phobia about about heights. Well, you know, I just I, I just went through the firefighters academy and I'm supposed to be up on this hook and ladder, but I suddenly realize I have a terrible fear of heights or whatever. Uh, uh, so there's that, or or somebody. I think I used an example where a you know a spaceship commander becomes a hoarder, you know, <laughs> and they, they won't like he won't suddenly suddenly decides he's got claustrophobia, <laughs> yeah, or something like that, or they you know, something happens and they you know and they're like they suddenly have this like psychiatric disorder. So that that can be both that can be you know some humorous relief but also it can help you springboard plot pieces off of it I, I would I would also say that um, when it comes to common common plot problems it, it what I usually see as in my work as a as a freelance editor and consultant what I frequently 
C is just not enough plot, not enough happens, you know, and, and so you you know that, that and that's something that newer writers they often they're just like, well, I I don't know, I've got these cool characters and I want them to do stuff, but you know, and often you just you need to give yourself some some time and space to get to know those characters more. What they might want to do and what they might do and what problems they might have and how they might go about solving those problems. I was just writing something to a client, in fact, this very day about uh, um, now so suddenly I lost my train of thought when I, um, on oh yeah, okay. This is character so development. What, yeah, so go into go into the emotion that this whatever character at hand at this moment of for in whatever scene you've got what emotion is your is the major character in that scene feeling what's going on inside them and get let yourself get deep into that and you can often get a sense of where to go and how to develop that scene and how to develop more plot from that character from what's going on inside them they can because you know how life works well we we you know, we see something, we react to something, we say something, someone reacts to what we say or to what we do, and then we react to that person or that, you know, event or words. So it's, everything is action and reaction, really, you know, in, in life is in, 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 and especially, especially in good fiction where life is distilled and made even truer than, <laughs> than real life might be. You know, along those same lines, another plot problem is... I don't know what should come next. That sounds almost like a little bit of, of, of a, a kind of a writer's block type issue, mm-hmm. um, although not entirely. So uh, what about that? So somebody uh, kind of hits, uh, presumably they've outlined the novel, but they're, but like you say, it's that it still is going to be organic in its own right. So you've reached this point. You don't know what should come next. Uh, what, what, how do, would you tackle that? Yeah. Um, you need to try to f- clear your mind a bit. Uh, taking a bit of a break is al- always nice when you're when you feel stymied like that. I I kind of refuse to believe that writer's block exists because that even acknowledging its existence gives it too much power in my feeling, you know. And so, mm-hmm. like, oh, so much of this is kind of tricking your own brain and your own personality into doing what you really want. Uh, so. Um, a couple of things. One, you know, clear your mind. Two, it, and another, I have three things, I guess. Okay, so uh, look farther back than where you are. Because if you feel like you've kind of run into a bit of a brick wall, go back, go back, look farther back, go, go 10 to pages back, 20 pages back, or 20 chapters back, depending on where you are and where, what are you doing. And often... There you will find some clues. You'll find you'll find what what led you to this point, and you're like, okay, well, if I don't want to be at this point, or if I want to be past this point, what might I change earlier on to help me? So that's that's a you know, I mean, and of course, this is all theoretical. I can't give any like literal examples uh, here. Uh, if we had a a whole day seminar on this, I could put some examples up on a on a screen and we could read them together, but, uh, but that's, that's the idea. Uh, and another thing is to, um, uh, realize that not everything, uh, there, there's no one right answer to what might come next or what should come next. You know, you can, you can, you know, think about what, what, you know what could come next what what might could happen next what might should happen next what's what some external factor or force what what could i drop in that might seem a little random but still might make sense but and you know in life random things happen yeah you can't rely on random stuff to drive your plot and characters through a whole book but you can drop in some little random thing that could help shift the course of a character or the course of 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 action you know that 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 your group of characters is pursuing so realize that you don't have to come up with the one perfect right thing and that there could be 10 or 100 perfectly good 
avenues to go down here. Uh, so, so that is that gives you freedom right there, and that that can help open up your your brain to 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 storm out some ideas. Right, right. You know, another one you you cite is I've got a complex plot, and all my final unraveling feels forced. And you know that the the other thing about that I see not only forced, and maybe these go hand in hand, but authors who just rush to the finish, it's almost like I'm I'm at 400 pages, I got to bring this thing to a conclusion. (laughs) And all of a sudden, they go on into warp speed. And it's like, whoa, what, you know, it's over. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even Tom Wolfe during uh, uh, The Bonfire of the Vanities, which I, I love that novel, but by the time you get to the end of it, it's kind of like, okay, he he just got up to a page count where he was like, I got to get done with this thing. And he, <laughs> and he rushed it. Mm-hmm. And he spent 11 years on that book is my recollection. So um, yeah. it just goes to show how vulnerable even, even very skilled writers are to this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how gutless editors can be. Because you got to realize that he, he sent that book to an editor and that editor had power, had some power over that book. And that editor had some power to say, hey, wait a minute, dude. Let's 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 talk about this ending here, you know, and and you know, be a little get a little demanding of the guy. So I don't know who his editor was, and I just realized that I probably am like denigrating someone whose name is in print <laughs> along with the book. So I apologize. It might be your I mean. yeah, my, uh, don't no don't no set not at all mob <laughs> against me or people with pitchforks to my house. Um, so so I mean so I mean there's there's a number of hands that a book goes through, but yeah. Uh, yeah, the, my my favorite horrible ending is everybody dies. <laughs> you know, like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait. You know, like come on, man. You know, you can't just you can't just do that. Um, so, I, in fact, I just just two days ago finished writing an article for Writers Digest, a brand new article for them that's going to come out towards the end of this year on how to write a great last chapter. And I used a number of uh, examples, exemplary last chapters in a number of different books. And I'll give you a sneak preview uh, here. Let's see. One of my favorites. Actually, I, I used one children's book in this group of five, and the children's book was The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett. And it's a great old classic, and it is a wonderful example of how to craft a book with a happy ending and part of having a happy ending is well of course you have to have some unhappiness before the happiness is you can't just have well you know start out happy and unhappy what's the book what the heck's the story so that's a really good example uh, and it so all right getting to and so what what okay so what Burnett did in fact i can just use this as a literal example here uh she so many of us know the story there's a, a sad little boy and a sad little girl and there's a garden and a gardener an old wise old man who helps them kind of get reborn into happier little people and the the sad little boy is supposedly disabled but he finds that he actually isn't disabled after all it was all just a bunch of bs kind of in in everybody's head around him and there's sadness there. The mother, his mother died or died in childbirth. I can't remember. Uh, I think so. Anyway, and so the, in the very last chapter of this book, the patriarch of the family who's been missing, the father of the supposedly disabled little boy, Mr. Craven, father of Colin, Colin, he winds up having an epiphany. He works through some grief. We, f- we see him work through grief, and we see him then slowly decide to return home. And he returns home. And well, I, before, I'm sorry, before, he, before we meet up with Mr. Craven, the narrator of the book. So here's a ner- strong narrative voice. This is an omniscient narrator. The narrator gives us a bit of a recap of the whole book by examining the character's kind of so far let's let's go back and look at everybody so far and now let's go to mr craven here he's in italy or wherever he is in europe someplace being sad and then we see him gradually real it's kind of like the passage of time has helped this man with his grief about his dead wife and now he wants to go back home and he goes back home and he finds that his son has it is not sad and and disabled anymore but he's happy and able-bodied and the, the other characters are all happy and everybody's happy and it is a happy ending and it it, it isn't sudden and it isn't fast so because he she could have written it that way and it just wouldn't have been as endearing to readers the what readers like to see and like to understand is 
the process that characters go through to get to that end point. You know, what are the emotions? What are the deals that they have to make with themselves or with others in the world? There are themes in some of the other books that I re- re- recount in this um, article that I mentioned. Uh, there, there are deep themes, John Steinbeck in uh, East of Eden, uh, just tremendously deep themes, um, uh, t- human evil, regret, uh, wrongdoing, crime, uh, f- f- lack of forgiveness and forgiveness, you know, blame, guilt, you know, big, big stuff. And he gets to, he gets through all of it and he doesn't rush through it. So yeah, you can, you, I mean, if you're, if you're writing a bang, bang, shoot him up, uh, you know, crime story, well, you can't, and some of them have ended with, I think Janet Ivanovich ended one with, you know, a, a single gunshot and out, you know, that was the end of the book. And it, but, how she worked it out was that it it you know, made sense. I can't recall details exactly. So sometimes you can get away with an abrupt ending, but most most of the time you need to have you need to have definitive. You need to get your plot elements pulled together, make that definitive, and then give us a little bit of a downslope there. Give us a little bit of the bloods getting mopped up and the you know. The, whatever right our milk and right you can't out. you can't end at the apex you need right. to have yeah a little bit of that down slope mm-hmm. otherwise it feels it doesn't feel complete right right now you know you also say my agent or editor wants me to cut ten thousand words <laughs> and you know i i think in terms of if, if you've got a 90 or a hundred thousand word novel mm-hmm. i bet that i bet it becomes better if you if you go through there and you're hunting and destroying ten thousand words that are superfluous mm-hmm. or not just words but sentences mm-hmm. I, I, so often i take a piece of writing or i've seen people <clears throat> excuse me take a piece of writing and just say in fact there there is an exercise where it's you know you cut ten mm-hmm. percent and um and you, you have a better piece of writing. And then you try to cut another 10%. Mm-hmm. And it might be better still. Uh, and you actually run that exercise until you actually are doing damage to the piece. It's like, no, it's not better now. I'm actually, you know, cutting muscle. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, but I mean, would you agree that in, in many, many cases, it's that's the best thing you could do is look to 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 distill that writing down to something slimmer. Yes, yes, certainly, especially for newer writers. Uh, a, a very good exercise to do is go to your bookshelf and take out, take, take, pluck off that shelf, or you know, whether it's real or virtual, and open a, a book that has stood the test of time or a story and read it and see if you can cut See if you can find extraneous superfluous words or phrases or sentences. And when it's a great work, you can't. You really can't, especially when you're <laughs> looking at some, let's say, I mean, uh, Ernest Hemingway is a writer who, who I always say is, you know, these days he's, it's fashionable to bash Hemingway because of the machismo and that he killed wild animals for sport and so forth. But but uh, that son of a bitch really could write. And I like to use his mm-hmm. work as as exemplars of good, tight writing. It, it, it's, it's expressive. It's tight. I use often the short story, very short story, one of his shortest called Hills Like White Elephants. And it's in a whatever in a number of his collections i think and it is it's a just it's a master class in in economy uh just really awesome so you can go and re- read you can read that and then you can look at your own work and, and you can read that and you can say okay can can i cut any of these words out here and have it even be the same sentence uh, have it make sense anything and the answer is, I swear to God, no. Uh, let's say just for that exact story. So then you go back to your own work, and you can start to see extraneous prepositional phrases. You can see uh, things like, "Well, do I adverbs? Do that I, don't belong yeah, there. yeah. Do I need? Do I need this yeah. many reallys? Do I need this many that's? Do I need this many <laughs> began tos? You know, the, the flaws that I see in uh, aspiring authors' work often they, there, there's this addiction to the phrases started to and began to, you know, I began to walk across the room. Yeah. Well, you yeah. walked across the room, you know, you would, you, 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 
you know, I mean, of course, yeah, you we have get to, it. We get it, you know? <laughs> yeah, right, right. I mean, it's sometimes, like to, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, it just gets into a little too much handholding with the reader. It's like, you have to trust the reader, understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. but, you know, do pay strict attention to, to um, uh, whether you are communicating and whether the reader is going to be able to track. No question about that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm glad you brought up Hemingway. And I notice in your bio that, that that you mentioned him. Obviously, you have great admiration for his writing. And I was going to say, when you were talking about the, the the earlier plot issue, which had to do with the character who turned out to be pretty much uh, mon a mon mundane character, and you were talking about, and maybe you don't need the character. And then I'm thinking, you know, there are many novels out there that just have too many characters. And some of the greatest novels have very few characters. And, and what popped into my head was the old man in the sea, which is basically, oh. you know, the old man, the boy <laughs> yeah. and the bird <laughs> well, and the shark. Uh, yes. And that, that was really it. But they had two people and the boy was only there in the beginning. I mean, it's a it's a it's a, a mm -hmm. novel that a uh, novella, really, that mm -hmm. is really based on that isolation. I mean, a good a good deal of it. One dimension of it is that isolation, the man alone in the boat out on the water and uh and struggling so uh yeah i mean that he the, that leanness that um leanness not only in the economy and the writing but also a, economy of characters so that uh mm -hmm. you don't get lost in there yes yes uh that's a good point uh mike uh you know it's, i'm thinking also how long the exact same line you just said the jack london story to build a fire there's a man and a dog and a box of matches and that's it and and the the, uh, the unforgiving uh landscape you know and, and the weather uh, so there's that but i'm also thinking about it, it more along Another example would be, let's say, The Great Gatsby. Okay, that's a fairly short novel, but uh, but and, and and he doesn't crowd it up with characters. You've got you've got the main you know the main uh, character of Gatsby, his his uh, his uh, his Boswell uh, being uh, Nick Carraway, and then. Daisy and Tom Buchanan, uh, Daisy being the object of Gatsby's desire, and then the kind of the sidekick of the the sportswoman, the golfer friend of Daisy, as I forget her name, and that's kind of like pretty much it. There's some other minor characters, the the the, the Meyer Wolfsheim character, the father that shows up at, near the end, uh, and of course then uh, um, Tom uh, Tom Buchanan's. Uh, uh, you know uh, his mistress Myrtle, and then her husband. So you've got, and that's like it. And so, and he, that's he a does novel a lot that has those. a bunch of parties and all. There's parties going on and all that. But he and he resisted the temptation to start introducing a bunch of characters from the party mm -hmm. and having them appear and disappear. Mm -hmm. um, at, so to to your point, uh, yeah, he was very judicious about what he let in onto the pages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And even long novels, let's say uh, the one I mentioned earlier, uh, Steinbeck's East of Eden, there is a limited list of main characters and he doesn't, you know, and he sticks with them and he sticks with them very deeply. And because, you know, because he's sticking with them, he can really get deep into them. And there's a whole lot of everything in each one of those characters. But, much can be found in a little, I guess, you know, to make, make a yeah. cliche observation there. What is your bu biggest frustration as a writer? Um, oh, golly. Well, I don't like to, to be negative, although sometimes people who know me, I think they think I'm moodier than I really am. I, I guess I'm kind of reserved. but So I try to see the positive at all times. But I suppose the, the greatest frustration as a writer is, and, and I think this is probably common to just about all of us, I wish I had a bigger audience. You know, I wish I could reach more readers. You know, why mm. haven't I reached more readers? Why haven't I written more books? Oh, well, that's another thing. You know, is the I suppose self criticism really is would be <laughs> my my main answer to that. Uh, you know, I should have written more books by now. I should have 
you know, done this or that by now. I should have made this or that career move by now. Maybe I should have stayed in a full-time job by now. I'd probably be better off financially, you know, although it looks like things are going to work out okay uh, for me here. But you know what I mean? It, the, the, mm-hmm. the, 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 some, some negative self-talk and I, and I preach strongly against negative self-talk whenever I talk with other writers, because there's just no point in it. And I, I need to be my own cheerleader a bit more than I am. I think sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that that whole issue of reaching more readers is, uh, you know, we live in this day and age where the technology has made things wonderful, but at the same time, it's made everybody, it's given everybody their own printing press. So there's just so much material out there. I think it's a million books a year published in the United States alone. It's terrifying. And um, <laughs> yeah, and, and then, you know, uh, I just did a podcast about, you know, I always ask people, what are you reading? And um, if they if they look at all like they're a reader, you know, what are you reading? And it's amazing how many just say, oh, God, I'm just not a reader or I haven't oh. read a book in years. Oh, um, and or or it's, uh, you know, I only read nonfiction. I don't read fiction. Hmm. And well, well, why not? You know, um, that sort of thing. Uh, so it, it doesn't exactly. Um, it just seems like there's an awful lot of people out there that aren't reading, and yet the market is being flooded with more and more material. So it just makes it harder and harder to actually get that get that reading audience uh, that that you're talking about. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, you know, it, we have such reach now. You know, you can post a, a comment or I mean, make a post on Facebook or Twitter or something and reach potentially billions of people. Um, but of course, it's not it's not automatic. Uh, uh, but yeah, b- building you know building an audience is something that takes to take some work, and but that can be fun. And I have to keep trying to tell myself that. Mar- I do find marketing to be a difficult thing f- for me because I was brought up to be you know modest and unassuming, and you don't tout yourself and you don't try to put yourself in front of people, and you know you you, you know that's the best way to be. And now I feel like uh, you know I'm, I'm I'm finding that writers and authors and public personas who who go against that who tr- put themselves out at every opportunity who grab for attention whenever they can who yeah they get they are they're more successful you know they read more people and i'm like god damn it you know it's like geez you know so i feel like it's, it's, it's so unfair so, you know, like, yeah so much for being a modest person huh? one one, per, one has to find one's own way and one's own comfort level uh, you know uh m- m- uh, I was talking to a man not long ago who is a psychologist, and we were talking about this sort of thing. And he said, "You know, i i could I could have by now in my career, I could have built a business where I built a clinic, and I could be the boss of a number of therapists and psychologists and social workers and so forth. Uh, and then." And then, and maybe I would, yeah, well, I would probably, you know, be, have made a lot more money. I would have been more prominent, uh, you know, all, and all that, you know, you, you know, provided even better for my family than I have. But he says, I, ha- I have to, I had, I, it wasn't in me. I had to go my own way. And if I were the, to be the boss of a big clinic, well, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be doing clinical. I wouldn't be, you know, working with people uh, uh, so much, or maybe not even at all. I would be an administrator and a boss. And so, you know. <laughs> there's a trade-off for everything, I guess, is, is yeah. part of what we're talking about here. It's true. It's true. Elizabeth, thank you for coming on the program. I appreciate your time. I'm honored to have been with you, Mike.